stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with their business, nothing to do with their applications. So I'm Josh Frazier, and I'm the Vice President of Business Development and Sales at RightScale. So my purview is clouds, ISV partners, channel partners, uh, and then of course end customers. And what we're going to talk to you about today is a lot of what we've seen our own enterprise customers and you know how do you define an enterprise? Well big companies, so F1000 and kind of the process that they've gone through as they evolve their IT strategies and more and more take advantage of cloud resource pools. So it's a lot of what we've seen firsthand. Uh, it's changing real time. Every customer that comes on board, we learn something new. Um, and hopefully you can get out of this just a couple ideas of how to get started, uh, a couple warning signs of what to avoid. <laughs> uh, take advantage of the folks that you heard this morning, like CBS, for example, and IHG. Um, and as you start to endeavor on your own strategies, you know, hopefully you can use this as somewhat of a path. Um, and all these are being recorded and they'll be posted online uh, in about two weeks usually. So just FYI, no need to take uh, scribble and take massive amounts of notes. So quick poll, H how many in here are uh, from enterprise companies, F1000? All right, who's currently doing something in Amazon or any other public cloud? How about a private cloud? All right, good. So a lot, a lot of folks just starting out. Fantastic. So let's, we're going to focus first on the journey we're seeing these organizations go through. Uh, some of the pitfalls. All right, so first-hand learnings uh, that we've seen companies kind of get themselves into a, a bit of a mess. Talk about how RightScale helps bring a framework and control back to the situation. Uh, and then we'll finish up on where to get started. Uh, and odds are, if you have any sort of infrastructure already of your own, uh, if you have an email address and a credit card, you know, you're ready to get started with something. So you probably all heard about, bought into, you wouldn't be here if you didn't, the shift that's going on. Okay, so I, I won't belabor the point here, um, but I did want to point out uh, another way to look at this shift, you know, as things more and more move to cloud architectures, is the whole underlying resource pool was designed from the bottom up with a fundamentally different methodology in mind. All right, so this is not about traditional tightly integrated application stacks. This is about open frameworks. A lot of open source is really what pioneered uh, the early cloud architectures. Um, the old stacks that scale vertically, data centers, very, very difficult, had a high amount of overhead. What we're seeing now is resource pools and clouds. And when I say clouds, I mean an API endpoint. Okay, so don't confuse clouds from cloud providers. Um, so when we see resource pools now that are cloud enabled, you're talking about resource pools that were built with horizontal scale in mind, with high automation and ecosystems in mind, um, that were first and foremost created for next gen apps. So it's a whole different ball game uh, in terms of what you can do, but it's also a whole different ball game in terms of the things you need to be aware of. And I like to remind companies large and small, which is don't confuse the cloud as the solution for everything. Right? This is not a strategy that's going to cause you to unplug your data centers. It's not a strategy or an availability that's going to cause you to just change everything you're doing. So although it is for everyone, it's not for every app. Right? And that's a very obvious, hopefully, but important thing to remember as you start to endeavor uh, in, in different ideas and different workloads. Those of you that caught Michael's keynote saw this, uh, saw this progression, but I want to use it again because this is very indicative of what we see typical organizations go through as they start to endeavor you know, down that road of hybrid, fully audited, automated cloud-based architectures. And we see this really in three distinct groupings. Right? <coughs> A lot of companies are here. Right? So how many people in this room have already virtualized? Okay. So a lot of companies are here, and some even mistake this for being finished, right? So this is a cloud. Well, it is a type of cloud, right, as some define it, but it's not a cloud as, you know, certainly we define it and as some of the customers that you heard this morning define it, which is it's not fully automated, it's not on demand, it's not pay as you go, all right? So what's happening here is that organizations and IT ops that are, you know, used to controlling that first three steps uh, of how IT evolves, Right, what they're finding is that elsewhere in their organization, end users, so individual developers, line of businesses, are having the opportunity that they never had before. And they're bypassing ops, you know, call it what, we, what you will, you know, black ops or 
however you want to put it, the point is they're conducting business and accessing resources outside of the control uh, of the IT ops group. Right? And this is what's going on all the time in these organizations, whether they know it or not. Right? So it's, it's, it's funny we see registrations come in with domains from big companies that we're talking to, and they think they're tightly controlled and coming up with this cohesive strategy to move forward, and it's already starting to happen. You know, the reason being is, you know, it's easy, right? And a lot of these developers and a lot of these line of businesses, they don't care necessarily about what's underneath. That's not typically their problem, right? They're more focused on, you know, hey, how do I get this cheaper? And how do I get this quickly? Right? If you have to launch a product, um, if you're a news organization and some you know, event happened that you weren't expecting, if you're you know, launching a new game, whatever it may be, all right, time to market becomes critical and a lot of these organizations will have cycle times from procurement to fully provisioned stack that are measured in months. All right, so really, really powerful drivers that are tough to control if you're an IT ops group. But where these groups need to get, where IT ops needs to get is to bring everything back in uh, to where they have visibility, they're back to standardized and compliant and certified stacks, and that they can truly benefit the on-demand, pay-as-you-go uh, utility models that cloud computing affords. So that's where they're trying to get to. The problem is, you know, it's not easy. And this is where we hear all the time, you know, focus kind of be put on the wrong places. People love to talk about security. I'm not going to talk about security today. I'm not saying it's not important, but you look at surveys like this, and this is from uh, this is from a recent survey that was done in July uh, around the hosting a transformation summit that was in Vegas with Tier One Research. And if you look at that list, it's not even top three. All right. So at a very very fundamental level, when customers and companies are thinking about how to take advantage of cloud computing, all right, what they're first running into is the same thing any disruptive technology faces. It's different. I got to learn something new. <laughs> all right. Where do I start? Uh, and then once they start start to dive in, they realize that it's not as simple as they thought. All right. So very very important factors and pressures going on inside these organizations to keep in mind. Um, you know, to put it in simple terms, if I'm an end user, if I'm a developer, and I need access to a server, well, I see a very simple web form that all I need is a credit card and email address, and I can get a server. I can get the same thing that used to require a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of time, a lot of approvals. I can just simply do it on my own. But to an IT administrator, to an IT officer, that's all the things that they see, right? A ton of complexity, a ton of concern. All right, they have a whole different set of roles and responsibilities that line of business owners uh, and developers simply don't need to worry about. So because of these pressures, what we see happening all the time is just a complete loss of control. All right? And you can kind of sum it up into, into three, uh, three key areas. You know, the first is IT leakage. I'm not even sure what that really means, but it just doesn't sound good. It can't be good, right? I mean, IT leakage can't be good. I think we can all agree on that. You've lost kind of your operational wrappers, right? Those tightly controlled, certified, and compliant builds that you can hand out when you're ready uh, to your end consumers, all right? Well, that's gone. And, you know, in a, in a very frightening way, you have absolutely no idea what's going on, right? It's, we've walked into companies that literally as extreme as, hey, I have 35 people that I know of submitting expense reports for infrastructure on their visa cards, right? How comfortable is that going to make a CIO or a CTO? Right, so all this stuff is happening and it's symptomatic of the pressures that you just heard me go through. So specifics, right, what used to happen on the procurement side is you had a process, you had procedure, you had approvals, you had forms. All right? It was a specific sequence of events that took place before that developer got access to the resources. You know, who's gone to Amazon or Rackspace and signed up for an account? How long did that take you? Four minutes. Four minutes. Okay. <laughs> Your requirements to get a server are a credit card and an email address. That's it. <laughs> so someone like me who has absolutely no business going to grab a server can go get one in four minutes. So pretty scary stuff if I'm working for any company that cares about controlling IT. On the provisioning side, well, that also used to be tightly controlled, right? Certified stacks were built. Images were bundled. They were delivered to the internal organizations, the internal customers. 
Now what's happening is organizations that are in the cloud but without wrappers like RightScale, well, they're still bundling images. So in the case of Amazon, they're creating AMIs. In the case of private clouds, they're creating bundled base images, handing it off to developers, and guess what happens? Developers are tweaking things, installing things, changing configuration parameters uh, around that server, running into problems, and who do they call? Well, they call IT ops, and IT ops has absolutely no idea what they did. <laughs> right? So they've lost kind of the wrappers and the controls around the provisioning process. And then finally, you know, governance and control. So, of course, security, but let's just start with user audits. Let's start with cost tracking. Let's start with things as fundamental as what ports are open, all right? All the aspects that you're used to as far as you, how, how you control your environments, all right? When it comes to the cloud, it's kind of the Wild West all over again, right? All these clouds are different. Their procedures are different. The controls they have in place and the settings are very different, all right? So this is the landscape that we see going on for organizations that have already started to take advantage uh, of these cloud-based resource pools. So the next thing we see IT organizations do is, well, turning to what they're comfortable with, right? Going with traditional vendors and perceived solutions, all right? So an initial reaction we hear all the time from organizations that have internal data center assets is great. I'm gonna slap on vCloud Director or I already have a cloud with vSphere. Okay, so they take traditional vendor solutions that are being very aggressively marketed as cloud, all right, and believing that's a solution, believing that they're done. Well, what happens is they realize that they're right back where they started, right? They have a very inflexible, expensive uh, solution in their, in their data center. So that's not going to work. Well, then they look at public clouds. And they quickly find something that we discovered three and a half years ago, which is all of these clouds are different. The APIs are different. The resource behavior is different. The location is different. The price is different. All right, there's an incredible amount of complexity underneath all these different cloud, uh, cloud infrastructure providers that makes it very, very difficult to use more than one. And if you start using one, it makes it very, very difficult to move off. All right, so that's not a solution either. All this is done in, in what we call kind of a do-it-yourself way, a DIY. And a lot of people don't, don't realize this off the bat, but clouds are sets of APIs, okay? And if you think about Amazon, for example, all right, that's one provider, that's five different clouds, all right? They just launched an Oregon uh, region, so now there's six. So one provider, seven, where's the seventh? GovCloud. GovCloud, thank you. <laughs> well, then you have to count eight, because GovCloud's in, uh, in Oregon, I think, as well. All right, so one provider, you know, in the case of Amazon, you know, seven clouds, all right? But these are just building blocks, all right? So if you think about these resource pools, yes, they have a lot of sophistication in terms of what can be done with them, all right? But in most cases, right, these are raw resources that may have some siloed services to address a specific application, but they're often not the answer for the complete solution. And ultimately, this comes down to how do you want to spend your time? So at the end of the day, do-it-yourselfers in the cloud uh, as they evolve. Yes, they have resources, but do-it-yourselfers find themselves spending a lot of time on the undifferentiated heavy lifting, stuff that has absolutely nothing to do with their business, nothing to do with their applications. Right? Did anyone hear Ronnie's talk this morning from Ubisoft? All right, so that's a hyper-competitive industry where they have to be able to deliver their games on time. They have to be able to scale to massive amounts, right? You launch something in Facebook, it could grow to 30 million users while everyone's thinking big. What happens if it grows in one-fifth the time they thought, right? So all these things and all these agility requirements all right, around the IT are what make their business successful, all right? But that's not what they're good at, right? They're good at developing games, all right? So it's all about how you want to spend your time. Here's, here's a recent email we got that really captures this perfectly. And I, to protect their, uh, uh, to, to not disclose their name, I kind of whited it out there. But this is a Fortune 100 company that sent in an email. Uh, they're a happy Amazon customer. They've been working on Amazon for about 18 months. Um, and everything's going along just fine. Well, what started to happen is additional divisions in their organization caught wind of what they were doing. They wanted to jump on the train. They also wanted to start leveraging their internal assets, right? So they sent us, uh, they sent us an introduction uh, to the IT leader of one of their other divisions, and these are the problems that they listed. 
right? He's got a positive experience, so no issues there. But the issues he's dealing with is, well, wait a minute, I'm not really sure what's going on. This isn't automated like I thought it was, right? Uh, image sprawl is something we hear about all the time, right? It's easy to access an AMI, it's easy to create one, uh, publish it out, you know, who knows what happens to it after that. Uh, and then almost every organization we talk to that has data center uh, infrastructure uh, within their domain wants some path to be able to better utilize that, right? So that's the end game is hybrid. So we see this all the time. Um, which makes sense when you think about what the goal uh, of hybrid cloud and cloud computing and this evolution is all about, which is workload deployment freedom. And you heard some of this this morning, which is, you know, again, clouds for everyone, not every app. And you want the flexibility to look at your application as one of a whole portfolio, decide whatever filtering requirements are right for that app and right for you, and then have multiple resource pools, multiple types of resource pools uh, available to you in terms of where you can deploy that app, right? So if the data needs to reside in-house, well, you're not going to deploy it on the public cloud, right? If you're bursting to tremendous levels over very short periods of the time or it's totally unpredictable, probably not good for the private cloud, right? So the whole point and the whole goal is you want to get to here, where you have choice, you have flexibility, right? So think about this as a simple evolution, right? So you go from you know, walking on all fours to you know, guy running around who's agile and strong athlete. The, the problem is if you don't do it the right way, you can end up like this, okay? <laughs> right, so that's what we want to avoid, right? We don't want the fat and slow where you gotta keep feeding an inefficient machine, okay? That's not the goal here. Goal is this, not this. <laughs> <laughs> I never got the context of where that slide came from, but <laughs> anyway, so, so what's the solution and kind of how do you navigate all this? How do you bring it all together? So this was published not too long ago by Forrester Research, and, and I, I poached it because I really like what it characterizes, which is, hey, there are multiple different types of clouds. All right, there's a whole lot of different stuff that goes on on top of those clouds, right? You have resellers, you have complete services, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what really lies in the middle is this notion of, of a cloud broker, right? It's someone who can, in a consistent way, you know, methodology, automation tools, um, allocate workloads across whatever cloud resource pool makes the most sense. And although, you know, marketing hasn't quick, you know, gotten behind me on this uh, slogan, you know, I'm going to throw right scale in the middle there because it's an easy way, I think, to characterize what we're all about. Right, which is we are the broker between all the different clouds that you want to take advantage of, including your own, right? and all the things you want to do on those clouds. And when people ask me, elevator pitch, you know, what do we do at a very fundamental level, RightScale enables you to deploy your app on the cloud resource pools that you want to. Right? I mean, that's where the connection between your app and the cloud resource pools that you want to run it on. Behind the scenes, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. And I'm not going to bore you with taking you all the way up this diagram, but I do want to point out a couple key things here. So at the cloud infrastructure layer, all right, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on. All right? There's obviously multiple different APIs. You know, again, all these clouds are different. Within the case of Amazon Rackspace, the big public providers, they have multiple API endpoints. All right? You have no choice in what they choose uh, to use for hypervisor, networking, machine type. Those are all made for you in the public cloud space. On the private cloud space, well, there you have some options. Okay? And RightScale has chosen to support three different enabling technologies, OpenStack, uh, Cloud.com, and Eucalyptus. Uh, and because this is a cloud enabling technology, well, there you have selections. There you have choices in terms of machine type. So you can pick your hardware. You can pick different networking configurations. All right? You can select any hypervisor that you want. So you have the opportunity to create a purpose-built cloud. All right? So the first key component of RightScale is what we call the multi-cloud gateway. Just think of that as a great normalizer. All right? We're taking all these differences, resource pools, API syntax, hypervisors, cloud OS, all right? And we're presenting them in a platform form in a consistent fashion so that you don't need to worry about the differences and how these different providers approach certain things. Easy example is running a database in Amazon versus Rackspace, all right? You're hibernating a VM in Rackspace, you're using EBS most likely in Amazon. 
Right, two fundamentally different approaches. Which one's better? Well, not for us to judge. Certainly not for me to judge. All right, so all these providers are coming up with different aspects of their solution. We viewed our fundamental goal as normalizing that and preventing, uh, excuse me, presenting consistency uh, to our end users. On top of that, we have a whole host of automation, uh, monitoring, and various different tools that will trigger actions you want RightScale to take. Um, but the next key thing to hone in on is that configuration framework. You've heard a lot today about server templates. Uh, you, anyone that sat in Yuri's talk before here, you know, saw some examples. All right, these are the definitions of the environments that you want to run. So think of server templates as playlists. All right, we spend a lot of R&D, uh, a lot of our own effort developing various different server templates that customers can take advantage of. Um, but you're welcome to write your own. You're welcome to modify ours. Um, you heard from Eric this morning from CBS. Okay, he hasn't taken a single stock template that we've used <laughs> out of the box. He's cloned it, all right, and modified every single one. All right, so it's a framework that you can create your own stacks or use what we provide you or leverage best of breed technology providers. So that's what our ISV program is all about, is working with technology providers uh, to publish their solutions in the right scale format. The governance controls, well, everything you heard me talk about earlier, but applied to multiple different clouds. Metering, billing, user account management, so on and so forth, and then access that through an API or a dashboard. All right, so that, that's what RightScale is all about underneath the covers. All right. And so how does RightScale help you get from where we talked about earlier you know, into where we want to go? Well, let's walk through this. So here's what we need to get. And here's where we recommend most organizations start. And, and obviously this is going to be for an organization that ha is already doing something. Okay, you know they're they're ready and they have a workload. Um, and certainly, if you're running in Amazon or Rackspace, you know this is a highly recommended place to start. And then we'll talk about uh, the next step, which is on your own infrastructure. So first, it's about getting visibility. Okay, so you can't control what's going on. Again, credit card, email address, four or five bucks, and you know you need to get a server, and you can do it. Right, so you can't control that. Our goal is to help you at least get some transparency back and some visibility into what's going on. All right, so that's step one. The second step is around if you have it and if it's relevant, cloud enable a portion of your own infrastructure. Not the whole thing. You know, that's a Herculean undertaking and will and we'll take a long time, but this is about, again, trying out a single workload, trying out a single application. Start doing something. It's literally as easy if you have a couple commodity servers laying around, right? You can throw CloudStack on there, register it with RightScale, and, and get going with a resource pool of your own. The next step is around how to control and rein in that VM sprawl, both internally on your private cloud and externally in Amazon. So getting some repeatable process that you can build and ensure uh, is complying with your internal certifications. <laughs> that also pleasant stopping IT leakage. <laughs> and then ending up in a very agile state. So a couple examples of that. Um, so here's, a, here's an example of visibility, and this is, a, this is another customer of ours that, again, I stripped out their name to, to protect who they are. But So probably a very familiar use case to a lot of people in this room. You have a global entity all right, that wants to negotiate and determine pricing all right, and wants subsidiaries, let's say they're regional subs, they want them to be able to take advantage of that pricing. All right, they want to segment by certain uh, project team. They want to segment by certain product. They want to segment dev from uh, testing from production. So what you can do within RightScale is set up uh, a parent and child and soon to be grandparent relationship of how these accounts relate. You can share configurations amongst those different accounts. All right, so if you're using a specific server template configuration that you want to publish uh, between accounts, you can do that by setting up private libraries. But the key here is all of this is across all the clouds that we support. All right, so hopefully it's obvious if you adopt the identity management solution of cloud provider A, well, that's not going to help you on cloud provider B unless they decide to get together and you know, come up with some platform solution, but that's probably unlikely. <laughs> Also within each account, you can segment what resource pools they have access to. This becomes very, very critical if you're dealing with sensitive data sets. If you have to ensure a workload stays on a private cloud, well, you can isolate the given account that you're allowing that developer to access to just the private cloud. And you're going to see a demo on how that works here in a second. 
From there, you have a whole different ways that you can do billing presentation uh, and cost tracking for these different divisions. And we see this by product, uh, particularly in the gaming community. Uh, we see this quite a bit where they want to get down to pretty detailed uh, ROIs and factor in infrastructure down to the hour uh, based on products. Um, so you can set things up as a portfolio. You can obviously bill an invoice by region. Um, and then there's a whole host of different audit and monitoring tools uh, across all of these accounts. So infrastructure audits is a common one that we see organizations take advantage of. So tell me where my SSH keys, you know, who has access to those. Tell me what ports are open across all the different instances that RightScale is managing. Uh, tell me what user A did, you know, the last two days. All those, all those tracking and metering capabilities are available across all the different clouds. The next step as far as cloud enabling, well, here's how this process works, all right? And please, if you have some spare hardware, try this out. Uh, give us a call. We're happy to take you through a POC. But we've literally had developers do this in a matter of hours. Now, this obviously isn't something you're going to turn over and run your production systems on yet. But again, keep in mind, this is about iteration, right? The cloud is an iterative process of adoption, right? This is not a wholesale migration. So. Pick your flavor, right? You want to go with OpenStack, great. Eucalyptus, that's fine too. CloudStack, that's fine. You know, pick your poison. It really doesn't matter to right scale. You can use that on most commodity hardware. It goes through a registration process on our dashboard. Uh, and usually, with not too much effort, you can get access and get to that green dot test, we call it, which is, means you have your resource pool that's cloud enabled now that's available within uh, the right scale management system. From there, you can take advantage of uh, one of many multi-cloud server templates. And key to our whole methodology, if you think back to that configuration framework, is design once, deploy multiple times on multiple resource pools. So single server templates, accessing multi-cloud uh, images, and multi-cloud intelligence within the platform can deploy on your resource pool or one of our public providers. And then lastly, you know, tie in a public provider, right? So needs there for excess capacity. Well, if you have highly, highly uh, unpredictable workloads, okay? Another reason you want to do that is just simply to keep your options open. So, I try to find a way to weave in the slides I like best here. So, <laughs> look at her hand if you didn't notice that. <laughs> so, just simple choice, right? These cloud providers are all located in different locations, like start there. They're all priced differently, right? They have differences in terms of what resources are available. Right, so keeping your options open is, is a key reason uh, to go multi and hybrid cloud, uh, but it's certainly not the only. All right, so this also solves many other problems that we see organizations deal with. All right, so availability in terms of where are they, right? Where is this region located? Obviously, security, compliance, certifications, all that good stuff plays a big role. DR, uh, did anyone get caught up in any of the outages, uh, the EBS outage in April? All right, there we go. All right, you got to have somewhere to fail over to, right? So that's another reason why you need multiple resource pools. Uh, performance is another big one. And the good news is, you know, and I couldn't say this a year ago, but the good news is there are a whole host of different cloud providers to choose from now. Uh, this has really been the year of multi-cloud, uh, despite our pushing in the past years. This is the year it's truly a reality of clouds at production scale uh, that are working within RightScale now. And we're seeing more and more kind of niche or purpose-built clouds emerge. All right, so a provider that we just, uh, just launched not too long ago called LogicWorks, for example. Well, they primarily focus on financial services. Their data centers are located in Manhattan. All right, so it's all about high I.O. And, and very, very low latency. All right, so there's a lots of different reasons why multi and hybrid cloud is important. So after you've registered your cloud credentials and regained that visibility, and hopefully cloud enabled your, your internal resources, well, then you need to start preventing VM sprawl. So the way you do that is with our server templates. Who here has worked with a server template before? OK, so a handful. Um, these are playlists for servers or playlists for multi-server, multi-tier systems. But unlike dealing with disparate images that are unique to every single cloud and don't move, you're dealing with a single server template. Um, so here's an example of a base server template that you can customize uh, for a Windows stack. All right, so this base server template works on Rackspace, Amazon, and any cloud stack, cloud.com based private cloud or public cloud. 
All right, so because of that, you don't have to worry about the differences. All right, you can access that base template and configure your scripting layer, or if Puppet or Chef is your chosen uh, approach, that's fine too, on top of the base template that we provide. These also evolve into complete solutions. Right? And you probably remember Michael talking about this this morning as well in the keynote. Just one of the more recent examples with IBM. Right? And they just announced and did a big push for this uh, two weeks ago at the IOD Summit in, in Las Vegas. This is their big data product. It's called Big Insights. Right? This is a solution that resides on RightScale and IBM looks to us and relies on us to stitch together the multiple different clouds that they want to make the big data solution uh, available on. All right? So they're publishing this stack within the right scale framework. All right, so we didn't develop this. Right? We didn't write a single script within this server template. This was all done by IBM's teams, uh, but it was published and it's now supported within the right scale framework. So our role in that partnership is to stitch together different resource pools that they want to run it on. So just two of many, many different examples that are available in the library. But again, if you want to write your own, knock yourself out. It, it doesn't matter to us, right? It really is whatever is right for your organization. And if for whatever reason, compliance, policy, preference, you want to write your own templates, you're free to do so. This is a framework, right? We're not dictating any specific uh, off-the-shelf template that you have to use. So I want to jump in and show you a, a flash forward, all right? Where is this going and what do we see the most advanced organizations uh, doing within RightScale in the cloud uh, as it relates to this hybrid model. So let's jump over and take you into a demo. So what this is all about is this is, you've heard this self-service IT mentioned a couple times this morning, right? So this is where this is going and in terms of potential, you know, hopefully the seed gets planted now and ideas start to flow of what this could mean to your organization. Um, it's a very simple example but it's a very powerful use case. All right, and what this use case is all about is organizations that want to do least cost computing. All right, so you want to provide your developers a way through a browser uh, to, on their own, whenever they want, get access to servers. All right, but you want controls, and most importantly in this case, you want to put it on the cloud uh, that's the least cost based on when that request comes in. Uh, and then the other component it has, which also very important, is where does that data need to reside, right? You want to make sure that you're not mistakenly putting things outside your four walls if they need to stay internal. All right, so let's jump to, let's jump over here to the demo. And the, all right, so here's our cloud server wizard. And this is typical. This is what we see with organizations like Ubisoft. Eli Lilly's another one that did this. Uh, that are more and more getting into using RightScale and our APIs to deliver self-service IT to their organization. So in this particular case, I have a couple different stacks I can choose from. So let's just stick with the 5.1. Um, the administrator, in this case Ryan Geyer at RightScale, decided that, hey, I'm only going to allow Josh to pick between a small, medium, and a large. Now, that can be whatever the cloud providers can support, um, and it can be whatever the in, uh, the administrator has set up, but let's just go with small. Let's go with one, so it's not going to cost us a lot of money. And we can go enterprise session one. Uh, can my data reside in the public cloud? Well, let's say no. It can't reside in the public because there's something sensitive about it. So I'm going to go ahead and click submit. And what's happening now on the back end is this interface using RightScale's APIs, all right, is accessing the RightScale platform. And in a second here, it's a really slow connection, but it's going to take me to my server, all right, that's fully provisioned and has automatically uh, gone into the launch sequence. All right, so here we are. So now we're at the server is called the nickname Enterprise Session 1. If you go down here, you can see a couple key things uh, about this resource. So first is the state is pending. All right, that request went in, and this server is now at the pending state. So RightScale is making an API call. It's running a series of, in this case, boot scripts, installing the necessary packages, applications, so on and so forth. Um, this server was put on a private cloud. This one happens to be uh, a private cloud based on uh, cloud.com's cloud stack technology. Uh, again, you saw me select that no, it has to stay, uh, the data has to stay in the private cloud. Right? And it's also using this base write image, uh, this CentOS 5.4, uh, 
64-bit write image. We're going to come back to that in a second. I just wanted to call that out. All right, so all I did was enter a few key variables that were set to me by my administrator, in this case, Ryan. All right, click the button, and in a few minutes now, I'm going to have a running server. What makes this possible uh, is this server template and framework approach that we take. So let's click on this server template, and you'll see in here this particular template for LAMP all-in-one uh, that's using MySQL 5.1. Well, it's set to support three different types of clouds, okay? And remember, types of clouds, not clouds, right? These are multiple API endpoints, but Amazon's a different type than Rackspace is a different type than uh, CloudStack. These leverage a base machine image, all right? So this is another key component to using WriteScale is that image maintenance, updates, patches, Moving images, well, we don't move images. We're maintaining our catalog and all the different clouds that we support, all right? So you don't deal with that complexity. The single server template is accessing a base multi-cloud image, all right? So we put as little in the image as possible. If you want to build your own, you can certainly do that and bundle in our agent. But from a methodology is approach, use base images that reside in the different clouds, the target clouds that you want to deploy in, and put as much of the definition and the configuration logic in that server template form. All right, so that's what makes this all possible. If I wanted to go in and actually make changes or modify, um, you're free to do that. All right, so a big policy and, and part of our whole approach is to keep things as open as possible. All right, so we're not dictating what you have to use. We'll provide you a framework and a base, but you're free to customize. Right? So all of this tied in with the intelligence that the administrator set up. So choosing what instance type I can launch on, where does that data uh, allow me to, uh, where does that data have to reside. Um, all that is determined for me. All I went in is actually just click the button. So let's jump now and we'll see, go back to the server and see what state it's at. All right, so here's this enterprise session one. Uh, looks like it's three minutes into uh, its boot time. It's got a public IP address. I can go ahead and SSH in here if I wanted to. Um, I can go here and look at my audit entries. Let's just take a look at uh, what happened here. So you can see right here that summary is operational. There's session one, and you can see the track of, of what I did, you know, when that server was requested and when it launched. So it's a, it's a simple example, but hopefully it captures the powerful concept that we're trying to get across, which is this whole sequence of events, all right, and the set of controls that were put in place here used to be something that was measured in months and tightly, tightly controlled by the IT, IT ops team. It was a whole process. All right, what you can do now using platforms like WriteScale and these multi-cloud architectures is you can leverage these frameworks, leverage our APIs to give empowerment that was never before possible to line of business owners, individual developers that drive business agility through your organization. And when people ask me what I mean by business agility, well, I have a pretty simple definition for that, which is when IT is no longer a hurdle of any kind. It's no longer a procurement hurdle. It's no longer a timeline provisioning hurdle. It's no longer a capacity hurdle. Imagine how your business changes when IT is no longer a hurdle of any kind. And that's what this is all about. So just to finish up, I wanted to leave you with um, two, two recent quotes uh, that I like, and they help capture what we're all about. Um, Pearson, most of you have probably heard, uh, heard of or at least read their books, so big, big education company. And of course, Erickson, I'm sure everyone knows them. Um, but why these organizations are making decisions to go with solutions like RightScale and uh, do it in this fashion is because in many cases for larger organizations or more complex workloads, no single cloud or no single cloud type is the right answer. Right? And they want to leverage the resources but have consistency around provisioning methodologies, configuration management, automation, user, account control, so on and so forth. And that's what they get by using the right scale management system. <laughs>